right. Welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today, we have Lauren de Rocha in the room. Thank you very much for joining, Laura. Thanks so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. So um, everyone, meet Lauren, who is an entrepreneur, um, business owner, um, coach, uh, life coach, healer. You have to have me to pronounce it, pro dom, who takes clients on a journey deep into the heart of themselves, um, which is basically the vortex. And we'd like to hear about the journey that brought you here to, your, to build your own business, to provide services of um, what nature and what is the vortex? How do we get in and <laughs> you tell us about yourself? Yeah, I'd love to. Um... <sighs> So my journey that brought me here um, is that I I lived for about 30 years of my life in a, a state of pretty severe dishonesty. Um, I experienced a lot of trauma in my childhood, and I developed a lot of coping mechanisms that I had no consciousness of, and I was a... a deep people pleaser. And I was really living a life that was absolutely not for me. It was for other people. Um, and I constructed a, a serious life that looked from the outside to be extremely successful. Um, I had the marriage and the house and the, I was climbing the nonprofit ladder in my social justice career. Um, and I was deeply miserable. Um, and I had an experience uh, where I was talking to a, a healer, an intuitive, where I accidentally confessed my my deep sexual desires, which which were very kinky, um, and I had so much shame about them. And when I realized that I wasn't going to die of shame when I admitted the truth about what my deep desires were, it started unraveling an entire a very long thread. And the more that I pulled on this thread, I realized that I was deeply repressed. And I was just, I was not just not telling the truth about my sexuality. I was not telling the truth about basically anything. I had no access to any part of myself that didn't fit into a box that I had deemed was good, mm -hmm. that would make me lovable and good, a good person. And, um, as I started exploring my shadow, the pieces of myself that I had been repressing and denying for a really long time, my life started completely turning around. And I decided to leave my marriage and ultimately to leave my job and to leave the city where I was living and sort of started over. Um, and it's been on that, that journey that I have discovered um, a state deep knowledge and deep healing uh, so that we can be much more authentically ourselves. You spoke about the trauma you experienced and how then you recognize it and learned how to get out of the little box that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Where you would um, realize that you had fit yourself into a box of expectations what your thought was good behavior. Mm -hmm. So my process of starting to understand the different parts inside myself, including parts that aren't so pretty, parts that my Catholic upbringing taught me would send me straight to hell, mm -hmm. parts that made me believe that I would be deeply unlovable if I showed them to anyone. So I couldn't even show them to myself. That process completely transformed my life and brought me to a totally new place. And in the process of all of this discovery, I also found access to a state of consciousness that I like to call the vortex. Um, and I consider the vortex to be a place that all of us can access where we 
are touching our own divinity, essentially, where we have access to our highest self and where we have access to deep, deep intuition and insight. And we can do incredibly powerful healing on ourselves when we have access to that state. Wow. Okay. That sounds big. I don't know if I've been there ever <laughs> before in this lifetime. And it sounds a bit spiritual. Um, you also mentioned that you have a Catholic upbringing. Uh -huh. Some of us are religious. I'm not. Um, I try to emphasize as also what we discussed just before the recording that people need their tribes, people need communities and religions by the very nature are such tribes and communities that provide protection, social, um, what is it, belonging. Yeah. Um, and they can also be harmful to the individual. Um, I think also the same with research communities, like in other episodes, for those who have listened um, to the show before or are in the academic system, we are well aware of um, the pressures in the system, the pressure to publish, um, the incentive system is measures and metrics oriented. Um, and there is a lack of attention to quality mm -hmm. as compared to quantity, mm -hmm. which causes a lot of trauma <laughs> actually at, on the individuals like the researchers because they are stuck in that incentive system and the only way out is to perform or to leave academia mm -hmm. um, and that drives many of us into serious mental health issues so right. in that sense I think scholars can maybe not so easily but can actually relate to what you describe um, if we see academia or a certain research community as a, as a tribe or as a community similar to a relig religious community with dogmas, with expectations to the individual, with regulations and um, principles, so many of which can also be good principles for coexistence, <laughs> for quality assurance, for um, learning and um, and growth and there's also uh yeah like certain pressure mm -hmm. points which are part of the equation and at some point they can easily become toxic right right and there's i think that there's right inherently pieces of that system where there are often expectations placed on people that that are impossible to meet. And when we can't meet those expectations, we're told we're wrong and bad. Mm. Not good enough. Or exactly. You don't meet our expectations, mm -hmm. you don't belong here. And that's when people feel isolated and sad and lonely and all of that misery. So how did you, like, what was the turning point for you? What made you realize or was an individual like a person or something you read that gave you a hint of, hey, it's not me who's wrong, it's the community I'm in or the, the thought pattern that I'm trapped in? I think that for me, the, the moment that happened in my life was the moment when I was with that healer and I had, I just was carrying so much deep shame inside of me about the things that I thought made me unlovable. Um, and the first time that I said out loud to another living, breathing human being, the things that made me so unlovable, I was, I was sure I was going to die on the spot. Like I almost had a panic attack. I had to go into the bathroom and I was like, talking to myself in the mirror, which I've never done before to be like, you're okay. You're alive. Mm. Um, and I really, um, no. revival of that moment, I think was the turning point for me. And then as I continued to, to start looking more 
into myself and allowing myself to just say who I am and how I feel in a given moment. Mm. Um, and, and that I have, I have parts inside of myself. All of us do. Um, sometimes I call them creatures. Sometimes I call them inner beings, the internal family systems model of therapy calls them parts, but that there are like almost personas inside of us that, um, that can come out at certain moments to take over almost. They kind of take the steering wheel and we don't always even notice that they're out. Mm -hmm. Um, But that having those parts inside of me, including ones that are less pretty uh, (laughs) or are really selfish or are really lazy or whatever other thing that we might deem a quality that's quote unquote bad, that I still get to love myself and I get to love those parts of myself, I think that was the biggest transition I had. And that helped me to then see the broader context of the fact that, oh, all of these other communities that I'm a part of, I'm not a part of uh, the church anymore, but at the time I was part of a nonprofit community who I think there's a lot of parallels to academia in just like there's there's a lot of very specific standards. There's a way that things are done. There's a kind of person you're supposed to be. And everyone is on board with that. And if you fall outside the standard, you can be completely ostracized. And the truth is that all of us are outside the standard. All of us have parts of us that fall outside the standard. All of us have parts that um, that resent the way that things are, that disagree with the way that things are. Um, and, and that's our shadow. And once I started to understand, oh, the problem is not that I'm the only one who has shadow and I'm the only one who's bad and I have to hide. I realized everyone's hiding. <laughs> that's actually just what's happening here. Um, when we have such a kind of dogma that's so intense where we believe there's so much charge around how something has to be and how people have to be that's actually usually an indication that there's deep shadow there Mm. and that have a lot of denial going on in the collective Mm. wow okay that is intense because it sounds so familiar from what i observe also in academia and other communities I think it's also part of human nature to uh, gather in communities because we need each other as a support system, either in the family structure and then also wider community on the village level or in cities and wherever so political parties, you, you name those or nonprofits. Um, interesting. So, okay. Um, so just just briefly coming back to when you mentioned that even like let's let's talk about purpose because mm-hmm. I feel that many researchers feel they step into their purpose by choosing a research topic. Mm-hmm. Like when I ask PhD students early in their career in their first or second year, they and they ask why did you become a researcher, they either say, Oh, to because I'm curious, because I, I enjoy research, because it allows me to stay curious and to explore. That's mm-hmm. almost like a childlike behavior to, to foster that throughout adulthood. And that's admirable. And then the other half almost, um, so I feel it's 50-50, says, I want to save the world. I want to cure a disease. I want to contribute my part to make this place a, a world of better place. I want to work towards justice, gender equity, you name it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's very focus oriented and yet they find themselves then in their second and third year trapped in a system that's purely metrics oriented and that they can really depend on not on the quality of the work but the output they produce um okay so that's one trauma that the system brings to the table so, but your work now as a coach, does it focus on traumas that arise throughout our careers and encounters in the lifetime? Or are you more focused on childhood traumas and how those influence maybe for our career decisions? 
Okay, coming back to the purpose question, I'm asking a lot of questions on, on this very <laughs> long <laughs> questioning. Um, right. So one approach to look at it would be, we have childhood traumas, we try to compensate them by choosing a certain career path, um, for example, in the nonprofit sector or academia <laughs> for the same mm -hmm. reason. Um, or we are fine, we, we have a safe upbringing and happy family, and then they, we get trapped in a traumatic um, environment or traumatizing mm -hmm. environment. Um, I think there were other questions that I kind of touched on before, but pick whichever you can. <laughs> <think. laughs> I, I work with people mostly to uncover the places where we're not even aware that experiences from our past have shaped us in a way that's really limiting um, in, in ways that have basically taught us that we're unlovable. And so I think it's really interesting what you were saying a minute ago about how and why people choose their careers. And I think for me, I think there's a, there's a question of deep uncovering that needs to happen for us to find you know, clarity of our purpose. Um, and I think that it can, sometimes we can get locked into careers and paths that may not actually be for us, but we have some system of belief that tells us why we have to. And I think in my case, yes, I was driven to be a social justice champion um, in ways that were actually really incongruent. They actually, I was not in alignment when I was in that part of my career. Um, and I just believed that it was what I had to do to be a good person, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And um, as I have done a lot of work to uncover my own trauma in my own past and understand all the ways that it was preventing me from loving myself and being my most authentic version of myself, that I realized I do have a mission in this world and I have a deep, deep purpose. And it's actually, it's much scarier than the thing I thought I was doing. It was really easy to direct the campaign for water justice because no one, no one ever heard about what I did for work and didn't immediately say, oh my God, you're such a good person. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> now people hear what I do for work and are often pretty scandalized because I include the realm of sexuality in my work and there's a lot of shadow around that um and so it's actually taken a lot more courage for me to find what my true alignment was um and so i think that's like that's one element is to 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 find ways where we can be really honest about what is what is our purpose and and what is actually driving us to do that work? Um, and is it actually coming from a deep place? I loved also what you said about the childlike curiosity. I think that that's a, a beautiful indication actually of being on a purposeful path when we're so lit up by something, we can't stop thinking about it. We want to know every single thing about it. I think that's a beautiful driver mm. um, for the work that people might choose to get into, especially research. And then, right, there's then this additional thing about how do you stay in that place of childlike joy and interest and curiosity and passion when we're inside of a system that is consistently putting trauma onto us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the best ways to deal with that, there's like not a a good solution. I don't have like a great idea um, for how to solve it, unfortunately. Oh, don't worry about that. That's actually my <laughs> mission also with the work that I do and many others. And it's there's a movement going on in academia. It's called the open science movement. And it's nothing new really. It's just about good scientific practices, but enabled by digital tools and the internet, which is highly confusing to many of us. And there's many service providers, many um, stakeholders involved, many pressure points, power plays, 
going on. Um, so for the researchers, they're confusing and uh, many feel lost yeah. in the realm of opportunities and threats that come with it. But mm -hmm. that's my job to fix. But I yeah. also to bridge to the unconscious world. You also mentioned um, the divines, like to get in touch, like in the vortex, we call the vortex. And I think it's also a term used by other life coaches, practitioners, um, healers. And this whole world of spiritualism is like a taboo for researchers by definition. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me a while, like joining an entrepreneurial community, learning about where we actually met, <laughs> learning about the, like what you just said, like how we are, chained in our upbringing and um historical events that led to certain governmental structures and political systems of western societies in both our cases and in other parts of the world other political systems that are not so much western um but driven by either monetary incentives power um greed like all these is it still virtuous but negative I don't know what the English term would be, but yeah. Um, so what brought us women was or heart-centered people generally into an inferior position and having to liberate ourselves to get in touch and into the vortex, get in touch with our purpose, with mm -hmm. our, our divine calling whatever you name it so again like this is all very borderline for researchers and i'm just learning about these things and trying to unlearn what i was kind of dogmatized to ignore in this world and i always felt there's something mi missing in this puzzle right um, because just to throw this in the big questions in life we like after I don't know how many centuries and millennia of research going on, or maybe not millennia, but one millennium for sure that's documented. Um, we can't answer like what's the spark of life, what feelings are. I mean, we can measure feelings and um, hormones, you know, um, roaming around our blood system and circular system, but like, what are thoughts? Where are they? housed in our cavities called bodies and what happens after death like not no researcher will be able to answer any of that like not psychologists not biologists not no one like we can see the heartbeat like early on in development but when and how that starts we can probably observe but the spark of life is like and i hope we'll never be able to answer that question because there's also beauty in the, in the unknown. Okay, but the spiritual uh, coaches in our societies are very much in contact with these things, maybe not having the answers, but allowing for unmeasurable powers to be part of our realities. Um, Okay, so this is kind of quite an ex excursion for many of the listeners, I guess. But good luck with now finding a response to that. I'll, I'll just drop the ball, or not drop, but I'll hand over to you. <laughs> yeah, it's such an it's such an interesting challenge. Uh, I think that. To speak to the incredulous folks for a moment, I think a place where the world of coaching and spirituality and where they intersect can often do a disservice in our society is where we have this image of like light and love and good vibes only. And 
and it, I think that a lot of times that can give us a reaction, especially for people who are academic minded, who are deeply science minded, who, you know, are like, mm, talk to me when there's some evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a reasonable, it's totally reasonable. And, and I think that sometimes when we, we just, we sort of see this world, uh, projected, you know, like social media influencers who are coaches. And there's just sort of this projection of like, life can be perfect if only you just follow me or if only you just manifest better, if only you just visualize, if only you just keep the good vibes only. And I think that's a really important thing to name. I think that in and of itself is a shadow of the industry. Um, And that like the actually the the work of spirituality the work of personal development is so disgusting it's so messy it's so brutal um it's not pretty at all it's not like yay life of my dreams i just like did some magical thing that i've figured out but no you can't it always fails for you but i figured out how to do it mm-hmm. um i think that actually the truth of where our where our development happens, which for me is deeply spiritual, but I don't think that everyone has to experience it that way. I think personal development can also be considered in a realm that's deeply psychological. Um, And if that doesn't feel like it has a spiritual component for people, that's fine. It's, I think it's still the same work. Um, and that is the the really disgusting, uncomfortable process of getting to know ourselves and looking into the places where we'd really rather not look, that we have parts that are really trying to protect us from bringing our awareness to. Thank you for, yeah, to, for, for finding the words. I think we managed to hopefully get back in touch with some of the listeners, if not many. <laughs> Because, um, yeah, just a brief anecdote, mm-hmm. when I was doing my master thesis in, the, in that lab, was very much molecular biology, um, and we had a researcher who, like, I, I specialize in evolutionary biology, which seems contrary to anything theological. Mm-hmm. But we had a colleague in the lab who was very much religious, like was a Christian. And mm-hmm. I how, like, what kind of divided personality must that be? <laughs> I, I openly ask him, and like, how do you bring your belief and your research in into one body, really, or one personality? Like, how do you balance the two? I don't exa- know exact. I can't remember exactly the answer, but it sort of made sense what he said. Okay, <laughs> if it works for you, it's fine. I can, I can tolerate that. <laughs> Just don't understand, but fine. Same, but okay. <laughs> So in that sense, so we have religious people, we're scientists, we have spiritual people, we're scientists. I think what you just said also allows for rational, like 100% rational people to find their personalities and to find their purpose and to, to learn about themselves, what they need, desire, and to allow themselves to voice that to other people and be authentic first yeah. to themselves and then also to the people they care about. Um, so what? what's a typical, I don't know, how do you work with your clients and what's your success rate <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> make it measurable again? <laughs> but I think like every step in self-development like is better coached or mentored by somebody else to have a mirror and not to get trapped in a thought spiral of some sort but also um yeah every step is a way forward or is a step forward in the right direction towards or inward into the vortex (laughs) yeah so there's is there ever a destination again now i'm fully authentic with myself or is it is it a journey until we die i think inherently yes it's a journey until we die but I also think that there are stages like levels that we can get to that feel like really big breakthroughs um where we're gonna 
kind of like stay on that level for a long time. And then like, there's always more to do, Mm -hmm. but for me, the way I think about it, what's been my personal experience and the experience I've had with clients is like, yeah. And I like the imagery used of like kind of going down into the vortex. That's how I conceptualize it too. It's like, we're, we're like start at the ground level and at the ground level, we have all of these protectors who are with us, who are a part of like, you know, these inner beings who are part of our system who we are usually not even conscious of. And I, um, those, those parts often can look like saboteurs. They are the ones who um, come up with the excuses about why we shouldn't move something forward in our life. You're about to, you know, when you like blow the job interview or you don't set your alarm correctly or this person who you really want to connect with, you have some opportunity to make an important connection for your career or for your personal life. And that day you just really feel so tired and suddenly you're like the, you know, the, the sovereign of self-care and like for the first time in six months, you're going to like prioritize your self-care by taking a nap and you cancel the appointment. You know, we're all guilty of those kind of moments. And in the moment when we're doing it, uh, the saboteur who's out is extremely compelling in our mind. In that moment, it's the only choice, like, Mm -hmm. or not even conscious that we're, that we're setting our alarm wrong or whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever that manifests. Sometimes those parts are protecting us from the fear of what would happen, like the unknown that could happen if we actually moved ourselves forward along our path. Um, And we're really until we become conscious and start to develop relationships with those parts of ourselves so that we can make them conscious and then actually be able to communicate with them. This is such a funny thing. Also, people feel very incredulous about it because it sounds very silly to like have a dialogue with someone who's inside of myself. Um, But my experience of it has been that it's just, it's true and it's very productive. Um, But so until we can make those parts conscious, we can't actually do anything about them. They're going to keep showing up in our lives and controlling how we are in the world. They're going to continue limiting us to the only experience that we know. And there are ways that our experience of trauma from our past is deeply integrated into that. Um, But if we want to break out of the pattern of knownness, even when like those patterns are not always serving us. Um, often they're not serving us, but they're safe to the ones in our system. I, I learned as a child how to keep myself safe in a certain kind of situation. Mm-hmm. And so those parts in me, they're very well practiced. I can handle all sorts of horrific stuff, but I don't know always how to handle like really good stuff. I don't know how to handle it when I receive the love and affection that I deserve. Or in the case of career, I don't actually know how to handle it. If I had a supervisor who was really super supportive of me and gave me the leeway to do the work that I want to do in the way that I want to do it, that to my system is actually much more dangerous than the known grind. Mm -hmm. Um, all the things that feel abusive and really frustrating to me. Mm -hmm. And so the, the work that we have to do is to like, understand that we have all these guardians, these unconscious parts inside of us controlling what we get to do. And as we start to make those parts conscious, develop relationships with them, understand how they are protecting us and like really appreciate them for the ways that they're, they've been keeping us safe. They've been holding on to a lot of pain, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, They start to become integrated. And so they're not so often coming out and taking the steering wheel in ways that I don't notice. And that allows me to kind of like drop a layer deeper into my truer self, into my higher self or my, in the IFS model, like the self-led part of me, which is 
akin to what I call the vortex. Um, and as I go deeper and deeper, I'm discovering more parts and they, so as you go down, it's like the deeper pain that we're holding that maybe we weren't ready to look at two years ago when we started our personal development journey. But as we can show the different parts in our system that we actually can handle the truth of our own pain, that is how we can start to become free from it and free from the limitations that otherwise keep us trapped in the box. Mm -hmm. And the more and more we practice, the more access we have to the vortex or to our more authentic selves. Um, and that, that is the journey. So it's not, uh, it's, I, I can't imagine that it could ever be finished, but I do feel like um, there's a set of skills that we can learn. And so that's the, the way that I work with clients is not to say like, well, it's a lifelong journey. So you're going to be my client for the next 50 years. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's usually more than six months or a year until people feel like they have a handle on the skills. Mm -hmm. And then then you can be off to the races and just continue to do the work on your own. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'd like to first ask, you mentioned an acronym, IFS model, what's that? Yeah, that's Internal Family Systems, mm. um, which is a model of therapy that was developed by a man named Dick Schwartz. Um, and it is the, it's, it's this concept of our, that we all have a system, a family system inside of us that's made up of different parts and those parts all have a job to do. Um, and inevitably they're all about protecting us. And so it can be really easy for us to hate on the parts of ourselves that we think are wrong and bad, or we get frustrated with because they keep sabotaging us. Yeah. Um, but actually the, the, mostly they're all just little kids who need to be loved, you know? <laughs> think so yeah totally agree because I want to bring in Hermann Hesse here because I went to a Hermann Hesse school here in Berlin and Hermann Hesse is a German was a German author but has been widely translated into all kinds of languages and disseminated to various countries including the United States so I don't know if you've heard about him if you haven't please read the Steppenwolf is one mm -hmm. of <laughs> because he speaks there mm -hmm. that every human being the message is really um, has in it so not only good and bad but hundreds and thousands of is it personalities but basically what we, we you refer to as some people call them demons some people call them as you said is actually not demons but protectors guardians um who eventually can't decide anymore or can't just differentiate between good and bad but they protect us either way um yeah, so I think that's an interesting, like literature has managed over the centuries, sorry for the warning, <laughs> um, has managed over centuries to, to capture the wisdom that we have in each of our cultures. And it's nothing new that you teach and learn and for others to benefit from your expertise to get in touch with ourselves. Okay, um, so yeah, Hermann Hesse. And Taiman Hess is interesting also because he's widely read in Germany because we're so proud of our authors and cultural um, legacy. But, um, well, the positive ones, not the obvious. Anyways, let's not go there. Um, there's more to us than Nazi Germany. Um, and that's been very unfortunate to say the least. But, um, but then I heard also, like, when I say I admire him and Hesse for his work, and all the books carry some spirituality, lectures, lessons um, to be shared, get in touch with ourselves on a lifelong journey. Um, so maybe it's a good also a reference book for coaches like yourself, or several books thereof, and other authors for sure as well. But um, then some people told me, Oh, Herman Hesse, I also read him as a kid or as a teenager, but you know, at some point you grow out of that mindset. It's like, seriously? Like I admire him so much, I really don't want to grow older if that's what I'm gonna lose as a result. And sad for you, that's your loss. But anyways, um yeah, I 
And I think that sometimes I don't, I'm not familiar with, um, with that author and, the, and that work in particular, but I think that sometimes we, here's what I think when we have something, we encounter something and we're like, ah, that's not for me. It just doesn't interest me. It doesn't do anything for me. And there's no like charge around it. Then yeah, I believe you. That thing's not for you. But when we have a, such a strong visceral reaction to something like, ah, oh, that's not for me. I would never, that's for babies. That's for kids. A serious grown up would never consider that. To me, that's actually an indication that there's a shadow there and that there's a protector part showing up who is really, really far out of their way to make sure that we don't look in that place. Yeah. And I, that's really interesting. I always notice that about myself and I hate to see it when I see it mm. because I, I hate that. And then I'm like, oh no. <laughs> what is it that I hate? What? There's What's too the much charge around that. And it means that probably somewhere inside some part of me that I have disowned really, really actually likes that or really believes that, but I'm afraid of allowing myself to access it. And as I come to realize now in my 40s, maybe it's also an age thing to come to realization of certain, certain things that influence us in our lifetime. Um, or what other people refer to as wisdom as you grow older. Mm -hmm. um, and some get it sooner, others later. Um, it's a blessing if you get it eventually, whenever. But um, what I came to realize is exactly what you said, like all the evil in the world is just fear and self-protection. Um, and I would go so far as even Hitler was full of fear and sure. against for mm. the fear and the violence and not even himself, but ordering others to be violent against mm. the group of society mm. and expanding from there. Yeah. I mean, and I, that's the same. I think there's a big similarity um, to Trump in the US and just the way that those kind of personalities can tap into the collective shadow and these, these parts of us that are largely unconscious when there's someone in a leadership position who's saying, who's touching that part, it like activates this darkness inside of us as a collective. Um, and I think that, I think that our best defense against leaders like that and the tragedies that come from it is actually our own personal individual internal work to see where do we have shadows where where do i have a shadow of racism where do i have a shadow of sexism where do i have a, any kind of ism shadow because we all have them inside of us and it's not our fault it's not our fault but they're inside of us and until we can acknowledge it with some degree of consciousness then we can integrate it then we can have eyes on it then we cannot fall into the zombie army uh that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna cause so much true harm in the world yeah exactly I totally agree to that so you mentioned leadership mm -hmm. i started it on a national level and then very well yeah so just briefly closing the circle on team leadership which again um yeah boils down to any sector as well as academia so bad leaders or insufficient leadership also in academia group leaders mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. principal investigators who mm -hmm. often uh, supervise not one or two, but several PhD students, um, technical systems, postdocs, um, have never learned any mm. leadership skills. <laughs> they just right. get onto it and find themselves doing a lot of administrative work. And we we will have and and I think um have yeah, we, we do have also um focus episodes talking about leadership in academia and less good leadership practices in general. Um but looking at leadership from uh, from your point of view, like, is it true? Maybe it's a yes or no answer. But would you agree that bad leadership also often results from what, what we discussed here? Like that people who 
get into power positions and turn out to be bad leaders are often full of fear and and um, insecurity. And how can we change that as a community? Mm. That's a great question. I think I think it's a product of two things. I think one is just that there are you named this problem. There are protocols that exist. There's training that exists on how to be a good leader and a good manager of teams and projects. And often just the way that the system works when people are good at doing a job, they get promoted without actually being trained at how to be good at being a manager. So that's like one thing that I think obviously is a big part of it. And then I think in addition to that, it's like there's this double whammy of then the fact that, yeah, there are often um, when we are unintegrated in our shadow, when we do not have eyes on the parts of ourselves that um, are terrified or are power hungry, are greedy, um, are threatened by women or any other demographic of people, when we don't have eyes on that, it's going to come out when we, the more authority and power that we accumulate for ourselves, the darker that that shadow is going to be when it gets expressed. And so you think in addition, like the training, that's obviously a big part of the problem. I do think that shadow integration work can be a huge, uh, can make a big difference in how people manage themselves and therefore have the capacity to manage teams. Mm. Yeah, I'm getting goosebumps before, because just recently I heard from a family member that another family member was not with us anymore. It's- it's been a while, so generation before us, um, was like the most humble and and caring and loving personality, but then in a leadership position made everybody cry (laughs) and kind of dismantled the whole good leadership structure Mm. into something that was highly Mm. toxic or devastating. That's Um, really interesting, almost like two different personalities. Yeah, and obviously full of uh, like what what we how we analyze it like he was probably full of fear to do anything wrong because he was not fit for the job, like not for the topic that uh, the company was um, in charge with, and also not for the leadership position because it came from a totally different professional context. Right. Right. That makes a lot of sense, especially I think fear is one of the biggest motivators. Um, for causing harm Mm, could we disturb that so listeners a lot of things to process here to digest (laughs) to analyze in your real world um, reality uh, circuses (laughs) 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 I find it I don't know (laughs) wow thank you so much Lauren it's been quite a conversation really do you would you like, maybe like whoever feels intrigued to explore your work further, would you like to share a little bit more about what and how you work? I mean, we, we discussed a little bit and how people can reach you. We will obviously share your details and the dark has now found his position. <laughs> um, so yeah, please, um, like how, how can people get in touch with you and yeah. Yeah, um, you can find me at my, um, my website is enter the vortex with two X's dot com. Um, yeah. Right. Um, Is there a reason for the two? What did you say? Why two X's in the vortex? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> is uh, to clarify that it's like a little bit sexy, but it's also a little bit classy. Mm hmm. Okay. <laughs> this would be too much. Um, I I would love to invite folks to reach out to me um, and schedule a call if you're interested in talking more about what working with me looks like. Um, I offer 
in like one-off sessions where we do um, deep in-person role play work to get to the heart of the places where um, where you have some experience or some trauma in your past that's holding you back to really go deep into that place and look at it um, and to find the spot where we stopped loving ourselves and to learn how to make a different choice to start loving ourselves um, and to do some of the work of reparenting um, and being able to give ourselves the, the care that we in most cases didn't actually receive the way we needed. Um, and I also do work that's six month uh, coaching packages where we're going a lot broader to unpack and to spend some time with all of those different parts so that we can learn how to develop relationships with them mm -hmm. um, and help get everybody onto the same team so that we don't have so much self-sabotage showing up. Thank you. And also like, thanks again for allowing us these insights into the work that you do, the expertise you have. And yeah, let's all be more authentic and self-loving and appreciating so we can be kinder to each other in the work and personal relationships that we all have and maintain and um, develop in time to come. Thanks so much, Lauren, and speak to you soon again, hopefully. Thanks you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.